Amen. Amen. All right, let's focus there at the very beginning of the chapter. Let's begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number 1, where the Bible says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Verse number 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And the title of my sermon this morning is The Resurrection in the Old Testament. The Resurrection in the Old Testament. We're going to spend 95% of the time of this sermon in the, in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. I'm going to go ahead and have you turn to a New Testament passage, though. Luke chapter number 24, verse number 24. Luke chapter number 24, verse number 24. But I'm going to show all the different prophecies of the resurrection in the Old Testament. And if you would have noticed here, we actually got... You know, the, the, we got the, what the actual gospel is, what the gospel consists of in, in these verses that we read. In verse number 3 again, he said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now you get the context of that from verse number 1 where he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach to you. So the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we're not dispensationalists. We don't believe in multiple gospels. We believe in one gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And I believe that that same gospel is how every single person that will make it to heaven was saved. Every person that ends up being in heaven was saved by that same gospel. Now, there was different revelations of the gospel throughout the Old Testament. And there are, there are obviously many pictures that we can see of Jesus dying, being buried, and rose again. And a lot of people sometimes, though, will have strange ideas. You know, and I, and I did, when I was doing research for this sermon, I was just curious, you know, about what other people thought about finding passages in the Old Testament about the resurrection. And there's multiple, obviously, you know, the more mainstream, you know, I think William Lane Craig was one of the guys that came up, some apologist, where he, he denied that you could find a single scripture in the Old Testament about specifically Christ's resurrection. There are multiple passages, just tons of passages, not only about Christ's resurrection, just about the resurrection in general. Now, first, my first way I'm going to I'm going to prove that if you go to Luke chapter number 24, verse number 24, this right here is actually uh, where Je after Jesus Christ had resurrected. It gives you the context there. We'll begin reading in verse number three, 13, where two men are walking on the road to Emmaus. It's Cleopas and another person. But it says in verse number 13, Luke chapter number 24, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of, com of communications are these? that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there, and there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, and have, and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. When they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? And then he says this, and to enter into his glory. So when they're discussing this, it's very obvious that they understood that Christ was going to take some sort of punishment and that Jesus was going to suffer. But the part where they, see, they start to seem baffled, the part where they begin to be confused, is about the resurrection. 
And notice what Jesus does when they become confused. He rebukes them. Now, would it make sense for Jesus Christ to rebuke them and say, Thou, oh fools, thou fool, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15? Would that make sense for him to say that here? If there wasn't a passage about the resurrection in the Old Testament? Now, keep reading what they say. So it says that he's, in verse number 25, Then said, said he unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things? And then he says, And to enter into his glory, referring to the resurrection. Verse number 27, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them, watch this, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And what's the context? He's speaking about, number one, him suffering certain things. Going to the cross, right? Taking our punishment and bearing our iniquities upon himself. But also he's speaking about in context, context entering into his glory. And then it says, Jesus says, it say, or it says that Jesus, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So do you know what Jesus Christ did? He started teaching them and preaching to them passages in the Old Testament about the resurrection and about himself resurrecting. I'm going to have you turn to another passage. Go to, uh, I'll have you go to Acts chapter number 24, verse number 14. Acts chapter number 24, verse number 14. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter number 23, verse number 5. <clears throat> it says, Then said Paul, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. This is Paul speaking while he was, uh, he's speaking to someone that had, that had, uh, had arrested him. Verse 6, But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and then he says this, Of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. Verse number 7. And when he had so said, there arose a decision of, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. Now look at Acts chapter number 24, verse number 14. Now Paul was being facetious in a way there to try to get himself out of being captured. It was caught, he purposely caused a division among the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But notice that, that just the, the, the preaching or the doctrine, the teaching of the resurrection in general, not necessarily related only to Jesus Christ resurrecting, but the resurrection in general was believed even by the false prophets, even by the Pharisees of the Old Testament. Look here in Acts chapter number 24, verse number 14. Paul speaking about his own belief. He says this, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. And then he says this, Believing all things. Does that sound familiar? Just like what Jesus said to them in Luke chapter number 24. He said that they didn't believe all the things that the prophets. Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, he said. Paul here says, I believe all things. And he was talking about, in context, the resurrection in Luke chapter number 24. Now look what he's talking about here. That after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. I'm going to have you turn to an Old Testament passage. Go to Genesis chapter number 22. Genesis chapter number 22. So notice that Paul believed in the resurrection. Paul said that he believed all that the prophets have spoken. He believed everything in the law and what the prophets had written down. Now we're going to start looking at a few passages here, but I want to start with the, more of the figures of Christ as of right now, as opposed to the very clear statements, the explicit statements. So here in Genesis chapter number 22, the context here, we're actually going to get the whole context. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. But it's where, G, uh, where uh, I'm sure you've heard of the story, where Abraham, God commands Abraham to take Isaac and to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah. So if you look in verse number 1, it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, 
and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And this is probably the, one of the greatest pictures and figures of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. There's so many things you can look to this and point out. You, know, you have Abraham who represents God the Father. Then you have Isaac who is the promised child, who is the seed of which Jesus would come. You have him tell him in verse number 2, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Right? Just like the only begotten son. Just like John 3.16. Then you see in verse number 4 it says, Then on the third day... Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Just like Jesus Christ resurrecting on the third day, right? You have the wood, just like the cross being that, that, that Isaac bore. Isaac was the one that was carrying the wood. There, if you look in, uh, in verse number 6, you have the two men. Notice he had two servants that went with him. Just like, just like the two people that were on each side. The two robbers, the two thieves and murderer that was on each side of Jesus Christ while he was uh, on the mountain of Calvary. If you keep reading there in verse number 8, it says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast withheld thy son thine only son for me. So keep your hand here and go to Hebrews chapter number 11. Now one thing as far as a principle or a rule of interpreting the Bible is if something is brought up in the New Testament, the New Testament always should interpret the Old Testament for you. The New Testament is basically a commentary for the Old Testament. The New Testament explains things in greater detail. There are greater revelations. I mean, the, uh, the subject this morning is the gospel, and that should, could be a, a serve as a perfect example of that, of how the gospel is just so much clearer. Not to say it wasn't clear in the Old Testament, but the means or the method of the gospel, of, of Jesus Christ dying, being buried, and resurrecting, was you know confusing to them. We saw that in the case of the two men that were walking. They knew that that was the Redeemer. Genesis 3, the promise that there would be a child, a son that would come forth of you know, man, of the seed of the woman, was given already. They knew, hey, the Redeemer's going to come, the Messiah's going to come and save us, but they didn't necessarily understand the whole picture of how. Now, look here at Hebrews chapter 11, and look at verse number... <clears throat> Look at verse number 17. So it actually talks about that passage that we were just talking about. It says, or we were just reading, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And then it says this, And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now what does it mean he received the promises? It's talking about the promise that was given to Abraham. It says that in thee and in thy seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. Now, Abraham, prior to this, was not able to have a child. And God promised him that through Isaac specifically, he was going to, he was going to receive that blessing. Here, God asked Abraham, after he had given the promise, to take Isaac up on the mountain and to slay Isaac and to kill Isaac. So now Abraham, you know, could be baffled. He could be thinking, you know, not sure what's going on. I thought that the world was going to be blessed through my seed here. But watch what it says. It says that he that received the promises, he that had received the promises, offered up, notice what it says here, his only begotten son. Just like in the Old Testament we saw where it said, thy only son. Verse number 18, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Watch what it says in verse number 19. Accounting 
that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. So it tells you actually what was going on in Abraham's mind. Because God can read the thoughts and God tells you that the reason why Abraham went away, went ahead and, and went through with that is that he thought, you know, he didn't think that God was actually, in his mind he thought, I'm going to end up killing my son and what the result is going to be is God's going to resurrect him. God's going to bring him back. He didn't actually believe that when he got up on top of that mountain, that he was going to, you know, God was going to stop him beforehand, which obviously takes great faith and great, great obedience to go through with something like that. And it says that he received him in a figure. So he knew that, hey, the promise that, that the world's going to be blessed, the, the Messiah who's going to redeem and save the whole world is coming from my seed. And I'm about ready to take that seed up here and I'm going to kill that seed which represents Jesus Christ and God's going to resurrect him from the dead. God's going to bring him back from the dead. That's what the Bible teaches that Abraham was thinking in his mind. Now if you look back at, at uh, Genesis chapter number 22, Abraham makes a very interesting statement that proves to you that he knew one way or the other that he was going to come back down off of that mountain with Isaac. <clears throat> look back at, at Genesis chapter number 22. Notice what he tells the two men that are with him. It says in verse number 3, And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And watch this, verse number 5, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. Now watch this, And I and the lad will go yonder and worship, now watch, and come again to you. So who does Abraham tell them that's coming back? He says, I and the lad are going to go and worship and come again to you. Now those two men did not know that Abraham was given a commandment to take, to take Isaac and kill Isaac on that mountain. But Abraham still believed one way or the other, I'm coming down off that mountain. And he believed that he was going to end up having to, you know, slay his son get by with one slay his son and then God was going to resurrect him again for you know because he, he received him in a figure he received the resurrection of Jesus Christ he believed in that that's what the Bible teaches turn to uh, 1 Kings chapter number 17 we're going to look at a few passages of people just being resurrected in the Bible uh, in the Old Testament specifically. 1 Kings chapter number 17. Now the Bible tells us of a few other figures. I'm not going to look at all the figures because that's not necessarily what I want to spend all my time on this morning. But the Bible mentions a lot of other figures. And like I pointed out there, it talked about after three days journey, right? After three days journey, it said that they, that they saw the place afar off. So we can see the you know, picture of the resurrection there of him being, of him get, being given life of him receiving the, the, the picture, the figure of Jesus Christ resurrecting on the third day. Just like how Jesus Christ, after three days and three nights, rose again. And Jesus also said that Jonah, being in the belly of the whale, was a picture of the resurrection. It says in Matthew chapter number 12, verse number 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus tells you that God could have just left Jonah in the whale's belly for two days. God could have left Jonah in the whale's belly for four days. But he chose specifically to do three days because it pictured Jesus Christ being dead for three days. But here's the thing. You say, how is that a picture of the resurrection? Did he stay in the whale? He was in the whale for three days, but guess what? He came out of the whale. So that pictures the resurrection. Just like after three days' journey... They'd see the place afar of off, and that day Isaac was given life. When it, that was the day that he was supposed to die. That was the day that, that God had commanded him to take. You guys are in 1 Corinthians chapter number 17, I said? Yeah, look at verse number 17. Verse number 17. And it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. This is a story of Elijah, the Tishbite fell sick, and his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance, and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. He said unto her, Give me 
lost my place. Where was I at exactly? Verse 18. Verse 18. And she said, I'm going to start over. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee? O oh, thou man of God, art thou coming to me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house, and delivered him in, unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, and notice who it is, it's not the daughter, See, thy son liveth. Just like Jesus Christ was resurrected, right? Now, there's actually some great doctrine that you can learn from this passage real, real fast. We're going to turn over to 2 Kings here in just a moment. But if you look there in verse number 22, it says, And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again. So if the soul is coming into him again, while he was dead, was his soul inside of his body? No. no, it was not. Now, there are a lot of people that teach something called soul sleep. Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, you know, different people teach soul sleep. And they teach that the soul and the body are inseparable. That the soul is the body, basically. Now, according to this passage, is that true? Because he tells you very plainly that the soul came into him again. And look at the end of verse number 21. He says, Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. That's Elijah speaking, but besides that point, we have the authority of God saying, and the Lord, uh, it's the Holy Spirit writing, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came into him again, and he, revi and he revived. So we have a passage in the Old Testament where God exercised you know, the power of resurrecting people. Obviously, Elijah was only able to do what God allowed him to do. And this power came from God. So we can see examples of people being resurrected. Go to 2 Kings, verse number, uh, verse number 4, or chapter number 4, I'm sorry. 2 Kings, chapter number 4. 2 Kings, chapter number 4, we're going to look at verse number 18. A very similar story, but this is with Elisha, who was the successor to uh, Elijah. So you have in verse number 18, And when the child was grown, it fell on a day that he went out to his father to the reapers. And he said unto his father, My head, my head. And he said to a lad, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees till noon and then died. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. Now look at down at verse number 27. And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet, but Gehazi came... I'm sorry, came near to thrust her away, and the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take my staff in thine hand, and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not, and if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. Now it doesn't end up working. Skip down to verse number 32. So Elisha goes, and when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door. So the Bible's clear, this child is dead. He is completely 100% without life. And shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched forth himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Verse number 35, Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him. And the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she was come in unto him, he said, Take up thy son. So notice over and over again, we see these passages of people in the Old Testament examples of people being resurrected and brought back from the, from the dead. And notice over and over again, what are they? Thy son. And those are the words specifically that are spoken. Take up thy son. And then Elijah said before, thy son liveth. Right? Go to um, 2 Kings chapter number 13. 
2 Kings chapter number 13. 2 Kings chapter number 13. Verse number 20. 2 Kings chapter number 13. And Elisha died and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. So he's dead and he's buried. He's in a tomb, right? And there's people that the Moabites invaded the land, it says. A band. So an army of them. A group of them. Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man. That behold, they spied a band of men. And they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. That'd be pretty scary if you were one of those other guys. If you you knew like, hey, this person I have is dead, and then you like spy some other people, and you you know you're carrying this guy, and you're getting ready to throw him in the tomb or bury him in the tomb. So, but you know you got to get out of there real quick. So you just take the body and throw it in, and the guy just like hits you know Elisha or whatever happens, and then he just stands back up on his feet. That'd be pretty freaky. But you know, the point why we look at these passages over and over again is because the resurrection existed in the Old Testament. Not only, I mean, it just proves, like, somebody could say, because here's the thing, there are a lot of people that just don't believe in a resurrection at all. They don't believe that it's possible. They don't believe that God would do it. Then why did He do it in the Old Testament? And you know what this does, too, as well? If you say, well, you know, maybe what if somebody doesn't have all the Scripture? Somebody tries to make up just some, you know exceptional situation that doesn't exist? And what if they don't have the scriptures that do teach that the resurrection is going to take place and that Christ is going to resurrect? All they have is stuff like this. Number one, I mean, this just proves that they can have a hope in the resurrection, which I don't believe that situation. Obviously, you have to be saved by the word of God in the first place. But people could, people could hear of these things happening. They could hear of Elisha raising someone from the dead. And then they could know in the Old Testament the story of Genesis 22 of the seed and they could see the figure of Christ being resurrected, and they could, have the, they could have hope in the resurrection from that. But that's not all. There are tons of verses that teach the resurrection. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 37. Ezekiel chapter number 37. And, and for a person to say that the Old Testament just doesn't teach that there's going to be a resurrection, or the Old Testament doesn't teach that Jesus Christ is going to be resurrected, is ridiculous. There are so many passages. Look here in Ezekiel chapter number 37, verse number 1. A lot of these, I don't even have to exposit for you or to give you any sort of explanation. They're just so plain and so clear that they're teaching the resurrection. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 37, verse number 1. This is the famous passage about the valley of dry bones. It says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them Round about. So he puts Ezekiel, the Spirit of the Lord basically picks him up and lifts him up and takes him to a, a valley, just an empty valley with just a bunch of dry, dead bones, right? And it says that he caused me to pass by them, round about. So he's either getting him to walk around or he's like taking him, you know, in a supernatural way around the bones. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. So he's trying to explain they're very dry. There's no possible way that these people could be alive, right? They're very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I, will, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, <coughs> Excuse me. Come from the four winds of <coughs> old breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, watch this, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. 
We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, all my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. <clears throat> And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. So notice he prophesies and he preaches here that there will come a day. Now, of course, this is symbolic of them being brought back into the land. But I think that this is as clear as can be that there will someday come the whole house of Israel. That's anyone who's a part of Israel. That's those that were part of the nation of Israel that were saved of the Old Testament. But you know that's also? That's also those who would be considered in the New Testament Gentiles. When you get saved, you become an Israelite. That's why he says the whole house of Israel. And those dry bones, you know, our bodies which lay in the, that lay in the dust and turn to dust, one day God will, will breathe life into us and we will literally live again. We will, our bodies will be resurrected. Go to another passage, Hosea chapter number 6, verse number 1. Another thing you can take away from this in Ezekiel chapter number 37 is that, do you know how they came to life? Do you know how they were given life again? By the Word of God, by prophesying, by preaching the Word of God. So do you know when you go out soul winning, if you don't quote a single Bible verse to someone... They're, you're going to walk away and they're going to be spiritually dead still. There's no possibility for you to give someone life because it's not your own words that can give life. Because God's word, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We have to quote the Bible. We have to quote Jesus' words. So he had to prophesy in order to... He said, speak unto them or preach unto them the word of God, the word of the Lord. You're in Hosea chapter number 6. We're going to compare two passages here in Hosea. Hosea chapter 6 and also Hosea 13. We'll begin reading in Hosea 6 first, because it's uh, numerically first. So Hosea 6, verse number 1, he says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for He hath torn, and He will heal us. He hath smitten, and He will bind us up. Now watch this again. After two days He will revive us, and the third day He will raise us up. So notice... After the third day, He will raise us up. Notice that. In the third day, He will raise us up, and we shall live in His sight. Verse number 3. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, His going forth is prepared as the morning, and He shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain under the earth. And if anybody knows about Bible prophecy and just, and just key search words about the former and latter rain, the latter rain is referring to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's referring to the, the latter resurrection, not of Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, but the resurrection when Jesus Christ comes back, the day of the Lord. Now, if you keep that in your hand, go over to Hosea chapter number 13, verse number 12. Hosea chapter number 13, it says, The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, his sin is hid. So no, he's talking about them being saved, right? They bound up their sin. It says, his sin is hid. The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he shall not stay long in the place of the break, breaking forth of children. Now watch verse 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Now watch this. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. So what's he saying? What is he talking about specifically there? Because he says, he says he's going to ransom them from the power of the grave. How do you ransom something? How do you ransom something? You have to pay for it, right? You have to have something that you're going to give in order to ransom something. Now notice what he says at the end. I will, he says, O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruct, destruction. Repentance shall be in from my eyes. What's he saying? That he's going to take those plagues. He's going to take that destruction upon himself. He's going to ransom them. Now this is a very, we're going to see a couple other passages that are very similar to this. And actually it was quoted, if you would uh, notice, in 1 Corinthians 15 a little while ago. But he says in the beginning that he's going to ransom them from the power of the grave. What is a grave? That's where your body lies, right? That's where when you die, that's where your body's going to lay and you're going to rot away, right? You're going to turn into dust. You're going to turn into nothing. He says he's going to ransom them from the power of the grave. Go to uh, another passage. Let's turn to 
Psalms chapter number 16, verse number 8. There's, a, there's quite a few of them in Psalms, so we're going to... I tried to order these so that it wasn't uh, real difficult to turn back and forth from each one. Uh, so we'll stay in Psalms here for a little while. Psalms chapter number 16. Psalms chapter number 16, look at verse number 8. <clears throat> Psalms chapter number 16, verse number 8. We'll begin reading verse number 7, just to get the context before I I will bless the Lord hath, who hath given me counsel. My reins, that's like my brains, my thoughts, also instruct me in the night seasons. Verse 8. I, will, I have set the Lord always before me, because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now verse 9. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. And then he says this, my flesh, all, my flesh also shall rest in hope. Verse 10 tells you what he's speaking about. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So keep your hand here and go back to Acts chapter number 2. This is quoted in Acts chapter number 2. It says it's speaking specifically about Jesus Christ. And I want to point this out as well. Here in Acts chapter number 2, this is Peter preaching. It's the apostles going around and they're preaching God's Word. And supposedly, you know, there wasn't any scriptures that taught that Jesus Christ had resurrected in the Old Testament. But isn't it funny, when they want to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know what they start doing? Quoting Old Testament passages. So look here in Acts chapter number 2, verse number 24, it says, Whom, referring to Jesus, the antecedent of Jesus, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. It's a powerful statement. Verse number 25, For David speaketh concerning him, concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. So the Bible teaches you that the Lord that it's speaking of is Jesus Christ. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. And then he says, moreover also, my flesh shall rest in hope. Now that alone is a passage that teaches you that, that David was looking forward to a resurrection, saying that he, his flesh is going to rest in hope, that he hopes and he knows one day that he's going to die, but that he'll be resurrected again, that Jesus Christ will resurrect him, that God will resurrect him. Look at verse number 27. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, says Peter, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with, is with us unto this day. So he's saying that there's no possible way that David could have only been speaking of himself here. Obviously, there are things that relate to him in this passage. But it's prophecy. So he's prophesying. He's a picture all throughout. Him being the anointed. Him being the, the, you know, the seed of Abraham. You know, the, Solomon as well. He talks about that in, in the book of Psalms. He's a picture of Jesus Christ who's coming. But if you look at verse number 30, keep reading, it says, Therefore being a prophet. So he's prophesying. He's speaking God's word. And knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins... According to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So who is this primarily about? Jesus, right? This passage was speaking that Jesus Christ would one day. So isn't it funny that David, being a prophet, he wrote these things down and he understood it. And then you see Peter plainly understanding and inciting Scripture and explaining you know, from the Old Testament that, that, that God had at that point prophesied of Christ being resurrected and rose again. Look at verse number 31. <clears throat> he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. So that, this just plainly tells you that this passage is about, it's prophesying about the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Now, there obviously why this passage couldn't be just speaking of David in all aspects is because David never went to hell. When David died, and I'm going to show you a passage here in a minute, David knew for a fact when he died that he was going to heaven immediately. Now, uh, let's look, turn over to uh, Psalms chapter number 49. 
Psalms, actually Psalm 17 is closer, right there. Sorry if you already turned. Psalm chapter number 17, verse number 13. I'm going to read to you from Isaiah 53, which is also another passage that preaches of Christ's resurrection, that Christ would resurrect from the Old Testament. Preaching from the Old Testament that Jesus Christ would resurrect. Verse number 1, I'm just going to give you the context. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? It's referring to Jesus, because it says right, right after that, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse number 5, speaking of how he took our punishment upon the cross. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes... You were healed. I'm going to skip down a few verses. I want you to just pay close attention to what I'm reading. Verse number 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. So the Bible is clear that this man, whoever it's prophesying about, obviously Jesus Christ is going to die. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. So he died for the transgression of, it says, God's people of Israel. Verse 9, And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was, neither was any deceit <clears throat> in his mouth. Verse number 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. So even though he had no deceit was in his mouth, he had done no violence, no transgressions, it says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, now watch this, he shall see a seed. Watch. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So it plainly said he was cut off out of the land of the living, and then it says that he'll make his soul, talking about his soul, not just his body, an offering for sin, or for any fact that he would go to hell. And then it says, it says that he shall prolong his days. Prolong, what does it mean to prolong something? It means when something's coming to an end, or when something has ended, from that point, it starts back up again. You're prolonging something that was going to end. You, know, you can't prolong something that's just going to last for eternity. You can't prolong something that hasn't ended, or that's not going to end. He's, he's referring to, the reason why I use the word prolong is because there was an end, because he died, because his soul was an offering for sin. There's plenty of passages all throughout the Old Testament that teach that Jesus Christ would resurrect. Now you guys turn where to Psalm chapter number uh, 17? Yes. <clears throat> Psalm chapter, you didn't turn anywhere because it's right on the same page. Psalms chapter number 17. <clears throat> Let's look at, what is it, verse number 13. Psalms chapter number 17, verse number 13 there at the end of the passage. It says, Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul. From the wicked, which is thy sword. From men, which are thy hand. O Lord, from men of the world, which have their portion in this life, and whose belly thou fillest with thy hid treasures. They are full of children, and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. Now watch this. As for me, I will behold thy faith, thy face in righteousness. So he's saying he's going to see God's face, right? Watch what he says next. I shall be satisfied when I awake. Look what he says also after this. With thy likeness. Now, 1 John chapter number 3, verse number 2 says this. Be, be, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So notice it says that when he appears, talking about the resurrection, the rapture, but just like in 1 Corinthians it says, behold, we, we, have, we shall all be changed, right? Talking about that there's going to be a change. It tells us what the change is here. It says that we'll be like him. And in what way? Also again, 1 Corinthians 15 explains that we're going to be receiving a glorified body. So David says when he sees God, right? When he wakes, he says that he shall be satisfied, says, that when I awake, referring to his body there, 
with thy likeness. Because he's going to be receiving a glorified body. Just like Jesus Christ has. Now look at uh, Psalms chapter number 49, verse number 6. Psalms chapter number 49, verse number 6. I believe it's speaking of his body because it says, When I awake, and there is no end of our soul. There is no sleeping of the soul. But you know what the, you know what the body is often referred to as? What state it's in? Sleeping. Those that at least are going to heaven. Now those that are going to hell, their bodies are dead and they will forever be dead. Their souls and their body. That's why he says, when I awake. He's referring to his, to his body being asleep. Just like he said earlier, my flesh shall rest in hope. He says, when I awake with thy likeness. So you're in Psalms chapter number 49. Look at verse number 6. Psalms chapter number 49. Verse number 6, the Bible reads, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves of the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. So it's talking about the person being ransomed from God, right? And it's talking about people, people that, it's saying the person that doesn't trust in God, they're trusting in wealth, they're trusting in, here's a simple way, they're trusting in anything other than God. And it says that they cannot ransom themselves. <clears throat> no, notice what it's talking about ransoming in verse 8. For the redemption of their soul is precious. Now watch this. And it ceaseth forever. Saying that their soul is going to cease forever. Talk about them being dead forever. Verse 9. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. So notice that he would be able to live forever, right? If he was able to redeem, to be able to redeem his soul or to ransom his soul. For he seeth that wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Now watch this. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. That's like what it talks about in Ecclesiastes 3. Verse 13. This their way is their folly, yet their prosperity approve their sayings. Selah. Like sheep they are, they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. Notice he's not speaking of himself. He's speaking of other people. Death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. Verse number 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. Now watch what he says. For he shall receive me. Selah. So notice there's a big difference between them and, and, and David, right? He says, God shall he says there in verse number 15 that God shall redeem my soul from the power of the grave. So notice that statement keeps coming up over and over again of being redeemed or ransomed, right? From the power of the grave. We're going to keep seeing that. Turn to Psalms chapter number 73, verse number 22. Psalms chapter number 73, verse number 22. <clears throat> Psalms chapter number 73, verse number 22. <clears throat> So foolish was I, and ignorant, I was as a beast before thee. <clears throat> this is actually a psalm, of, a psalm of Asaph. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. Now watch this. And afterward, receive me to glory. So notice he says you're going you're to guide me with thy counsel. And afterward, receive me to glory. The reason why I believe, obviously, you can, there's, there's two applications. You can say when he dies, he's going to go to glory. Of course, I believe that. But the reason why I believe this is definitely a passage referring to the resurrection was because, if you remember, Jesus Christ said to Cleopas and the other man who was walking on the road to Emmaus, he said, ought not Christ uh, had, ought to suffer these things and entered into his glory? And that was specifically referring to the resurrection. I'm going to have you turn to another passage. Go to, uh, let's go, we're going to go to the book of James now, or the book of Job, I'm sorry. The book of Job. Job chapter number 14. <clears throat> Job chapter number 14. <clears throat> Job chapter number 14, verse number 10. Job chapter number 14, verse number 10. Job speaking, you know, in his, obviously in his very depressed state, he says, But man dieth and wasteth, wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? 
As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and drieth up, so no man, so man lieth down and riseth not. Now watch. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake. So is he saying they're not ever going to wake? No, he says, till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake. Right? They, till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake. Then he says, nor be raised out of their sleep. So notice over and over again, referring to the body that's dead, he keeps referring to them as being not awake or being asleep. And the reason why God refers to the saved person's body as being sleeping or not awake is because there's some day when they will be, when they will be resurrected. They will be brought back to life again. <clears throat> and then he says in verse number uh, 13, Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time and remember me. Uh, people that are, that are post-wrath, We'll try to use this verse to try to prove that the, the, that the, the you know, tribulation, everything is post-wrath. Then the resurrection. He's talking about the wrath that is being afflicted upon him right then at this right. moment. Yeah. He's saying that the, until thy wrath be passed, because he believes God is mad at him right now. God's afflicting him. <clears throat> so he says in verse number 14, If a man dies, shall he live again? Now watch this again, over and over again. All the days of my appointed time will I wait. Till my change come. So he keeps seeing that word coming up again. Change, change, right. Talk, and then David was talking about till I awake with thy likeness. And uh, that obviously is referring back to 1 Corinthians 15. Now go to uh, another passage here in Job. Look at Job chapter number 19. Just flip over a couple of pages. pages. Job chapter number 19. Look at verse number 25. Job chapter number 19, verse number 20, 25. Job speaking. Verse number 24 is a great verse for the, inspir or the preservation of God's word. Job said that they were graven with an iron pen, speaking about his words. We'll read verse 23 too as well since we read that. All that my words were now written, all that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. So he, notice redeemed and ransomed keeps coming up as well. The same words keep coming up. He says, I know that my Redeemer liveth, right? And remember, remember God said, when we looked over at Hosea, He said that He was going to ransom them. That means God. And we see ransomed and redeemed as well. I don't know if you've, I, I didn't point this out, but over and over again, ransomed and redeemed are being used synonymously. And God's the one that's redeeming them. God's the one that's ransoming them. That means He has to pay something. And He told the grave that He would be the plagues, right? He told destruction that He would be the plagues. So Job believed that He was going to be redeemed from death. Obviously, God was going to have to take part in that. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Now watch this verse. And though after my skin worms destroy this body. So he's saying when I'm laid in the grave, you know, the worms are going to eat my body. They're going to eat my flesh. He says, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. So he's making sure he's clear. Whom I shall see for myself and mine eyes shall behold. And not another. He's saying not someone else is going to see him. Though my reins, watch this, though my reins, he's talking about, the word reins refers to your thoughts, but in a literal sense, oftentimes it's used to speak specifically about your brain itself. He says, though my reins be consumed within me. He's talking about his brain just decaying, you know, his brain being brought to nothing. Worms just destroying his flesh and eating his body. He's making sure, you know, if you make making sure that you understand this. That he's not saying that someone else is going to see God. He's not saying that someone else is going to see the Redeemer upon the earth. He's saying, even though this body that I have today, after I die and it's completely destroyed, I'm going to stand upon this earth and I'm going to see my Redeemer. With the same eyes that I have now, they're just going to be changed. The same body that I have now, the same flesh that I have today, even though it will be eaten and destroyed, there will be a day when I'm brought back to life and my, my Redeemer will stand as well upon this earth, and I'll see Him with these eyes. Turn to Daniel. <clears throat> Excuse me. Daniel chapter number 12. Daniel chapter number 12. Daniel chapter number 12. So to say that, that the people, even the people of the Old Testament... You know, didn't have didn't have some sort of scripture themselves. 
or didn't have God's word and prophecies that taught that the resurrection would recur, occur is ridiculous. It's just so far-fetched. There's repeated scriptures, and in, 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 like Jesus said, in all the law and all the prophets. So look at Daniel chapter number 12. We begin reading verse number 1. Speaking of the end times. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time. Speaking of the tribulation. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So the Bible couldn't be any clearer here. You know, it tells you, and many of them that sleep in the dust. Notice sleep and awake. All those words used over and over again. Sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 26. Isaiah chapter number 26. Here in Daniel chapter number 12, verse number 13, it reads as well. But go thou thy way till the end till the end be. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest. Notice the word rest. Just like David said earlier, that his flesh shall rest in hope. Thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. <clears throat> so you're at Isaiah chapter number 26, verse number 12. Isaiah chapter number 26, verse number 12. Isaiah chapter number 26, verse number 12, it says, Lord, Thou wilt ordain peace for us, for Thou also hast wrought all our works in us. O Lord our God, other, God, other lords beside Thee have had dominion over us, but by Thee only will we make mention of Thy name. They are dead, they shall not live. They are deceased, they shall not rise. Therefore hast Thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Now if you skip down... For sake of time, leave verse number 17. Like as a woman with child that draweth near the time of her delivery is in pain and crieth out in her pains, so have we been in thy sight, O Lord. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. We have not wrought any deliverance in the earth, neither hath the inhabitants of the world fallen. Now watch what Isaiah says in verse number 9. Thy dead men, speaking to God, his dead men, his people, thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. And then he says, awake, notice that word again, and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. You don't have to flip over, but if, if you looked at verse number 1, you actually know what he's talking about singing. It says in verse number 1, And that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah, we have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. And it tells you the songs. That's a song that we'll sing you know, someday. And Isaiah will be there as well. Isaiah will sing. Because you notice he says, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they rise. So Isaiah himself, he had hope in the resurrection. He believed that the resurrection would come one day. And he knew that he himself would be resurrected and brought back to life. I'm going to have you turn over to another passage. Go to... Um, Isaiah chapter number 33. Isaiah chapter number 33. Just about finished right now. Isaiah chapter number 33. And here's one. I wanted to use this one because it's just very subtle. I want you to pay attention. I'm going to read it to you. It's very subtle what is said here. But he says, you know how God oftentimes, keep this in mind as well, that God will repeat things. And he'll say it in different ways, one after another. So he says in 1 Samuel chapter number 2, verse number 6, The Lord killeth, this is, this is Hannah's prayer, The Lord killeth and make it, maketh alive... He bringeth down to the grave, and then it says this, and bringeth up. So even in Hannah's prayer, she's teaching the resurrection. Just something very subtle like that. The resurrection can be found in all books of the Bible. Because I believe what Jesus said. Whether it's found in a figure, whether it's found in a prayer, whether it's David prophesying and preaching specifically about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or preaching about himself being resurrected, Isaiah preaching of the resurrection, Hosea, we can go on and on and on. To say that the resurrection is not in the Old Testament is, is to say that the gospel is not in the Old Testament. That's why it's so important. Look at, uh, I, uh, you guys are in Isaiah chapter number 33, is that correct? Yeah. Isaiah chapter number 33, look at verse number 17. Isaiah chapter number 33, verse number 17. 
It says, Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. Now, if you skip down to verse number 20, it tells you what it's talking about. Look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eye shall see Jerusalem. So where is he talking about seeing? Because he said, Thine eye shall see the land that is very far off. Talking about seeing Jerusalem. Now, keep reading. It's very clear that it's not the Jerusalem while on this, that's on this earth, the physical Jerusalem. A quiet ha habitation. A tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed. Neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. Do you know how that cannot be speaking of the Jerusalem that, that now is? It's because that Jerusalem, since this scripture has been written, has been destroyed twice, two different times, and was not inhabited. Then the Bible clearly says that it's a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall be removed. Now, to look at to see what king it's talking about, seeing the king in his beauty, look at verse number 22. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver. He says, the Lord is our king, he will save us. So in context, the king was God. Speaking of singing, seeing the king in his beauty. This is the last passage I'll have you turn to. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Verse number 51. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I'm going to read another one from you in Isaiah chapter number 25. Isaiah chapter number 25. And it's verse number 8. It says, He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from all faces, from off all faces, and the rebuke of His people shall He take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it. And it shall be in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him. He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. So notice over and over again, here's another passage. He will swallow up death and victory. The Bible so clearly teaches the resurrected in the Old Testament. But let me say this. There was a reason why the apostles were confused. The reason why some people understood and some people didn't, they were, at that time, I believe they were babes in Christ and they were growing because they, they did a lot of silly things. I mentioned this last week. They weren't mature Christians. They understood the scriptures more as time went on. It was very obvious that Paul made a lot of mistakes in his early Christian life, started correcting those later on down the road. Peter as well, you know, when he was dissembling and everything with the, with the Gentiles. You know, he made a lot of mistakes. And I believe mature Christians, if they would have had the Old Testament Scriptures, would have clearly understood everything very well. They knew they were going to be redeemed, and that the Gospel is the good news, and that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was going to save them. They didn't necessarily understand the method. But they would have understood it if they would have read the Bible more. Because it's very clear in the Old Testament. Very clear that there will be a resurrection. Very clear. And it's very clear that Jesus Christ Himself was going to be resurrected. That the Messiah was going to resurrect. Now, they in the Old Testament were looking toward the cross. So everything was not as clear to them as I said. We in the New Testament are looking back at the cross. They, the people that did understand that there was going to be a resurrection in the Old Testament, understood that Jesus Christ would come and redeem them and resurrect. They were looking toward promises that had not been, that had not been fulfilled yet. They were looking toward things that had prophecies that God had preached. And you know what they had to do? They had to believe that it was going to take place. They had to have faith, just like we do today. Now look there at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, watch this, the saying that is written, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? <clears throat> the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if somebody were to ask me, you know, why do you believe? What is different about your religion than all these other religions? You know, what's, what's the difference between, between your... What's the difference? Let's say this. 
What's the difference between Jesus Christ and Muhammad? Just the, the, besides the fact that he's God and all of that, of what he did on this earth, Muhammad is dead. Muhammad's body is laying in a grave today. And I'm, I'm, you know, I get the, the opportunity, like the Old Testament saints didn't have, I have the opportunity of looking back at the cross. And it's, you know, the Old Testament saints didn't have the opportunity of celebrating Easter, of celebrating the day of the resurrection of the Messiah that has already taken place. And it's great because you know why? Because I have a sure hope. Do you know why I know for a fact that I'm going to resurrect one day? Because the person that I'm trusting in was able to resurrect himself 2,000 years ago. Amen. That's why I know one day that my dead body shall live. Isaiah believed it anyways. You know, all these people believed it anyways. I would have believed it at that time as well. With whatever gospel that I would have had. You know, I would have put my faith in God too. But you know, it's a lot sweeter in the New Testament. When you know that the prophecies and the promises have already been fulfilled. When you know, because you know why? Because we have a sure hope. We have a sure hope. We have something that we know for a fact is going to come true because Jesus Christ was already able to do it 2,000 years ago. So that's something great to reflect upon. That we're not just, you know, we're not looking toward the cross. Or we're not looking, you know, forward to the cross. We're looking back to the cross and we're able to celebrate Easter and be thankful. Because there's a lot of saints just like you who lived in the Old Testament, believed in Jesus Christ, and they didn't have the opportunity of having Scripture written down in the New Testament that, that where the prophecies were fulfilled. Where the Scriptures were fulfilled. Where Jesus Christ resurrected and it was written down and you have the New Testament to give you that sure hope. They had hope in the Old Testament, but it was a different, it was a different hope. It was, it was different. Unto whom much is given, of whom shall much be required. The Bible talks about repeatedly. And there are people, you know, there are saints of the Old Testament and great men of God, the Bible teaches, that, that, that wish badly that they could see and hear and know the things that we know today. So don't take that for granted. Understand, you know, what you really have on Easter and what we really are celebrating, that your Messiah, that the person that you're worshiping, is it laying somewhere in a grave somewhere? That he actually resurrected. And, and, it's, and it's a great hope, not only that he resurrected, but that all I have to do is trust in him that he's able to do that. And then I get to go to heaven for free. Isn't that a great thing? Amen. All right, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for Easter. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for all the great, amazing scriptures, not only in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament, dear Lord. We thank you for the great saints of the Old Testament, who, who served as a, an amazing example, dear Lord, who believed your word, what, however much it was that was written down. They had faith in it, dear Lord, and they knew that, that they were going to re be redeemed from the grave. They knew that they were going to be ransomed you know, from the grave, Lord. And we ask you that you would just instill in us a great, a great faith, dear Lord. Help us to increase in our faith and just to believe in you and, and to grow in your word. We love you and just be with us daily. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.